You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. And our topic today is the prosperity gospel and a theology of suffering. And our guest is Kate Bowler. Yeah, Kate's the Associate Professor of the History of Christianity in North America. That's a long title at at Duke Divinity. Um, But it means that she knows what she's talking about. She's also the author of the new book, No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. Yeah, an academic has also gone through some stuff, and she melds those things together and makes a really compelling number of points about suffering and about the prosperity gospel. We learned some stuff that I didn't, we did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it was it, – it's fun to have guests who are both educational, like learning things, but also relatable and having right. just gone through life – and uh, and she definitely brought both of those in spades. Yeah. It was a fun episode, if we can say that, about suffering. Yeah, right. right. Which we can, because we're weird like that. we can do what we want. That's right. All right, let's get into it. There is no cure to being human. Finitude is going to be part of this deal. But man, do I understand prosperity gospel that says that they just want to be able to look back through the details of their life and be able to draw that straight line between, and then things worked out, because I have a God who loves me. I no longer live in a world in which God's reasons are immediately discernible to me. I just don't. Well, welcome to the podcast, Kate. It's great to have you. It is so good to be here. So we want to start with just just to kind of set the stage of what is the prosperity gospel. Maybe give us a little history too, a little a little meat, oh. not just the the, the dictionary definition. Well. But then why did you? How did you get into this too? So it's like kind of three in one here. Just go. Sure. Well, I was, and, and we um, want the history going all the way back to Jesus, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> he was a pensive man. He yeah. This is a know. special uh, um, nine-hour episode yeah. of the Bible for Normal. Well, let's see. I was a very um, easily disappointed Canadian on the prairies of Manitoba, (laughs) and I saw that a church that looked like a factory had gone up near my house, and uh, I had honestly, they they had just put up a red light, and um, it was our only uh, fast road that goes around Winnipeg, so I was very disappointed, so I was just sitting there stewing about this red light, and then I just saw hundreds of people pouring out of this, I thought, um, industrial wasteland, which turns out was uh, a megachurch, and I'd never seen a megachurch before, and then I discovered that it was not just a megachurch, but it was a prosperity megachurch, or at least people were telling me that there was a pastor who talked a lot about money and that he had recently been given a motorcycle for a liturgical holiday called Pastor's Appreciation Day, and that he had driven <laughs> that motorcycle around on stage. And I was so whipped up, as you can not imagine, already knowing me for low these 30 seconds, <laughs> that I get very easily incensed. And I was like, absolutely not. This is for Americans. And I told everyone that, and I wasn't entirely sure what I meant. I, I think I was mostly frustrated that... But you were right. I was, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I was absolutely, I think, mostly right, except at the time, it was mostly my Mennonite friends that were going there. This Okay, so you were raised Mennonite. I uh, went to a Mennonite church, Mennonite Bible camp. I'm not ethnically Mennonite, but I married, married a, married a okay. penner. So okay, gotcha. I have been welcomed into the... The Mennonite mafia. Yes, the cheese eaters of the prairies. And uh, yeah, and I thought, well, Mennonites won't do that. They're, you know pacifists, you know, always just a Marie Kondo experience away from from a mid-century modern aesthetic, and I thought, no way. And so, when I went to school in the States, I thought, what an interesting question is, like, how are these, how is this language of health and wealth popping up? And so, I thought I would do, I thought I might read a history book about it, and then when I couldn't find one, then I just got this very creepy look in my eye and was like, this is it, this is my plan. So, <laughs> I... I ruined my whole 20s visiting mega churches and religious theme parks and attending healing services. And I was, of course, immediately struck by the fact that the prosperity gospel was, like I had done, too easily caricatured, is that I thought, well, this is this is not respectable. This is not um, – it was too easily dismissed. And so uh, I, I began a more thoughtful – more considered, I hope, study about what are the kind of primary theological themes of the movement and where do they get their origin. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Uh, no. This is actually no. the end of our conversation. We're done. Thank you. Super nice to 
<laughs> it was so great. C- could you talk about some of the mischaracterizations and maybe the theological underpinnings of the prosperity gospel? Sure. I mean, I think the first most distinctive part about it is has a very unusual language for faith. Is that maybe in regular, like in Sunday school, I'd always been taught that faith was a synonym for for hope or for trust. And I realized quickly that they meant, but by faith, they meant that it was a kind of spiritual power. It was like a latent force that could be unleashed by a certain spiritual mechanism. So they were teaching people how to speak positively in a certain way, curb negative speech. This was always kind of a nightmare for me at the very beginning of a megachurch service where you're like sitting beside a stranger and they're like, how are you doing? Ew. <laughs> Ew. That's like passing the peace or something. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, you start just gently complaining about something and you realize that when someone says, how are you, that it's a trick question because right. the answer is blessed. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So I I thought, oh, wow, there's a there's such, such an enormous spiritual formation around certain kinds of speech and also certain kinds of thought and practice that there was a lot of emphasis on visualization, on, say, if you're sick, like putting scripture around your house so that by by seeing it, that you're constantly stoking the work of faith. And um, yeah, and, and it was that definition of faith, which in fact had a much longer history than I expected, that it came uh, really out of a, the confluence of maybe four different streams beginning in the late 19th century, that one was um, a very deeply American confidence in a righteous individuals and bootstrapping and, you know, that, that came out of a, a very particular kind of uh, Gilded Age capitalism. And uh, the other was a combination with um, the early Pentecostal movement, that they were really kind of playing around with uh, what makes the difference between someone who is healed and someone who is not healed. And it was primarily faith was used mostly just to test uh, test healing and not not yet money. That came later. And the development of a very rich metaphysical tradition in the United States, that that language of like frequency and vibrations and that aligning your faith with this these these universal laws as sure as gravity, that that was, you know, what we kind of now think of as either maybe um, from The Secret or Oprah or mm-hmm. just your local Peloton instructor. Um <laughs> <laughs> had in fact a, a, a very long, rich, and, and quite sectarian history that 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 poured into the movement. And I guess maybe the fourth thing is just what unifies them all, which is just a wildly high anthropology, just a a, a, a theology of what of, of of human potentiality. Meaning that that it, we're sort of we're, we can tap into the divine in in these greater and greater ways through yeah. these mechanisms. Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it, and it sounds so. It's it's got so many cousins that I'm sure that we can all immediately think of, right? That it has it has resonance with certain theologies of sanctification. That we are like a perfectibility project, though I'm sure okay. Methodists, upon hearing that, would be sort of throwing themselves off a cliff right now. But the feeling, yeah, that that the divine is, you know, I, I remember like a, a sermon by Creflo Dollar, who's a famous prosperity preacher, and he said, you know, when when Jesus comes back, he's He's going to look at us, and it's going to be like looking at a mirror. It's going to be so hard to tell to tell us apart. And I think that is such a sky high anthropology that to imagine that we could really become something so close to divine is um, is yeah, it's an anthropology on steroids. So where you mentioned the the money part came in later, but I yeah. know that's kind of the caricature. So how did that become part of this scene? In, sure. this, in this process. It had some sort of early play. So one of the first developments in New Thought was the, the move from faith for health to uh, faith for finances. So we've got some early 20th century money manuals and those cheap dime novels that, that were they're very much like the Horatio Alger stories that were also yeah. very popular. This is kind of like a, a city religion, something that helps explain the difference between the rich and the poor when people are all crowded up next to each other. But Pentecostals didn't really get, and and they're the kind of the primary bearers of the prosperity movement, is they didn't really get so into the story about money until the 40s and 50s when a group of tent revivalists became very popular in the United States and Canada and northern Mexico, and uh, they would pop up these sort of canvas cathedrals and host 
huge gatherings. And these these demonstrations of faith, like lengthening legs and laying on of hands to cure all kinds of diseases, soon sort of was buoyed by this post-World War II economic confidence in which people were bulldozing fields to make suburbs and suddenly had these cars that looked like land yachts. And this economic confidence that the especially white suburban America was experiencing sort of begged more and more theological language. And so people began to promise things like, um, you know how they always have kind of like giveaways or you like you mail in a certain amount of money you're going to get. It used to be like just anointed handkerchiefs, but soon it was wallets that might multiply money inside of it or... Hmm. We should take notes, Jared. We need to do this kind of yeah, stuff. For thank our, you. Yeah, I feel yeah. like podcasting is always, always a medium that needs a financial model and that's a, it's a really <laughs> yes. good one. You just need to... It's our next campaign. <laughs> Well, and they needed more and more language for it. So even the language of seed faith, which is a very distinctive prosperity phrase, like the idea that your faith is like seeds that get planted in the ground and you're, they're sort of dormant for a season and then they, they spring up and the harvest is always more than what was planted. That was a term coined by televangelist, faith healer, Oral Roberts, mm -hmm. in order to try to make sense of the idea of money multiplication. So they're, they're really kind of inventing words, playing around with it as they are, in fact, going from mostly men who grew up as quite poor Pentecostal kids with a faith on, from the wrong side of the tracks to like a very, I mean, gosh, they were some of the very first television pioneers. So they very quickly established themselves as sort of suit and tie kind of guys. Right. You mentioned Oral Roberts and Creflo Dollar. You know, for people who are maybe new to this, sure. what other famous uh, prosperity gospel preachers have been out there that they might be aware of. Yeah, well, and there's there's kind of every demographic kind of has their own famous prosperity preacher, and this is true internationally. Like, I was in Guatemala that has uh, um, uh, their prosperity preacher is a guy named Cash Luna, and I was like, oh, this is Cash. wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, there's always a, a local, but. Um, that's but, like a made-up novel name. I know, you know but that isn't it wonderful? Possibly. Yes, right. he needs his own television series. So, black, white, Hispanic, each kind of had its own celebrities. And so, in uh, African-American uh, prosperity theology, the earlier celebrities were Sweet Daddy Grace, um, the Great Depression. Uh, in the, the, the 50s and 60s, it became Reverend Ike, and he mm. had so charming. Um, he used to have these... You know, don't wait for your faith by and by, but you know, have it all now with a cherry on top. He had he was always was great with these sort of wonderful shticky kinds of sentences that always caught people's attention. And I mean, the one of the earliest sort of theological pioneers of prosperity theology was Kenneth Hagin. And and, and much of this, in terms of the infrastructure and the theology, really grows up in the urban sunbelt. I'm using my hands so because mm. it's a visual medium, obviously. <laughs> gentlemen. So, you can just see that I'm doing urban sunbelt gestures right now okay. with my hands. But from, um, you know, Tulsa, Dallas, all the way, you know, California was anchored in the 80s by Jan and Paul Crouch and Frederick Price, and then all the way over to Atlanta with folks like uh, Creflo Dollar. And um, and everyone had their own flavor. So, I mean, the Reformed had uh, Robert Schuller and his Crystal Cathedral. And the you know, the more sort of rough and tumble had the um, people who are a little bit more um, like, well, Jim Baker got very smooth, but uh, mm -hmm. you could kind of pick your own flavor of prosperity mm -hmm. theology and it was going to be everywhere. So what was undergirding this biblically? Because I, it, I sort of grew up in this, you know, we had uh, Creflo Dollar, Jesse Duplantis, Paul and Jan Crouch, like definitely in our in our wheelhouse growing up. Yeah. What, you know, and the Bible was very much a part of that. So what were the verses that they turned to, to sort of prop up and give evidence for why they're in the right in, in kind of in the Christian tradition that needed to be followed? Jared, can I ask you that question? Because I feel like I'm with two, I mean, biblical scholar, so it feels like now's the right time for me to say, what <laughs> What verses did you get when you're, because I'm so, I'm going to, I'll throw a bunch your way too, but I'm very curious. Well, it's interesting because just when you asked that, I would have to go back and really reflect on what the whole verses are, because I think the bigger point was there were lots of pieces of verses. Mm -hmm. So, there was like the stitching together mm -hmm. of 
um, you know, the, the analogies and the metaphors of like storehouse and yeah. treasures and it, basically anytime f- like riches and treasure and finance was yeah, like brought in Proverbs up. Or right. That, yeah. yeah, you yeah. would yeah. just take pieces of that and then sort of throw it all together. And then it just became the sheer amount of it. You start getting convinced like, well, I mean, yeah. there's like mm-hmm. 12 of these passages that mention this kind of thing. Like it just feels really compelling. Yeah. But I don't remember a lot of like here's a whole parable of Jesus that's about this thing. It just yeah. became, it was a lot of snippets. Yeah, I think of the, like the Abraham story too, just, um, yes. he had a lot of stuff. He was a rich guy. He know? was, and, and, yeah. And he had so much stuff, he couldn't and even King live with David his nephew. And yeah, there right. were, yeah, examples of You can of find affluence. it is the point, right? Yeah, you can right. find, pass, well, you can find, that's why it's not, I mean, it's, they're not getting, nobody's getting this from the Bible. Right. I mean, that's at least that's my impression, Kate. No one's the Bible is not the source of it. It's more something that can come into conversation with things like these these sociological things that you refer to. You know, the American competence, early Pentecostal movement, high anthropology. There are well, there I'm are gonna, cultural things. I'm going to disagree with Pete, and then How you can you? decide, Kate. You're going to be on. <laughs> I will. The, I feel. On the, the I feel stand ready. Here. Thank you. The only thing I would say is, and this once I want to get into the nuance of this. This is also my way of segueing us. But there is something in what we might call to kind of be nerdy, kind of the Deuteronomic theology here mm-hmm. of if you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do yeah. bad things, bad things will happen to you. I feel like that was not. It's not. It wasn't moralistic, but in my tradition of this kind of prosperity gospel, we took it out of a moral realm. And not just if you do good things, good things will happen to you. But if you follow these right paths, these great things will follow. Well, you'll prosper in the you land. You will prosper. Right. I mean, you have that. Right. There, right. So, yeah. it's right. taking a Deuteronomic theology <clears throat> and then overlaying it with kind of our cultural context of right. like, well, we didn't need to not be invaded by enemies. We want to get rich or we want these other – we want health. So, to say it's not found in the Bible, I would just – I would maybe challenge that and say the entire framework sometimes of the Old Testament kind of does follow mm-hmm. this. If you do good stuff, good things happen to you. It just happened to be that our flavor of it was a little different. So, Kate, weigh in on our, our conversation. Yeah, who's right? Who's right? I'm kind of way into what I, I really would have said Deuteronomic comparative to, really. like the I think the, the arc of it about uh, the relationship between reward and righteousness feels really intuitive to people scripturally. I also think um, – you know, Proverbs is hella bossy on these sorts of never have I seen the righteous go hungry sorts of things. I mean, it struggles, of course, with, um, you know, the martyr of the martyrdom of the early church and the general um, failure of Jesus to prosper. But in one account, in one sort of <laughs> account of. Um, I like how you just throw, that's like a throwaway. Yeah. Uh, there. We'll just keep moving on past that. But their, their atonement theory is quite uh, particular on what precisely Jesus dies for. Like, to what do we nail? Like, uh, you know, the cross. And, and uh, for a very well-developed healing theology in which not only our sins, but our burdens and pains, and then therefore our, our very specific diseases, I mean, not to be silly, but some of it does, f- uh, it feels, uh, I just... There's been moments where I'm like, did you just pray about elephantiasis being nailed to the cross? So I did have moments like that. Yeah. But uh, they're, they're, the, the particularity of assigning our illnesses with a spiritual solution and then watching you know, Jesus' wounds, and there's all kinds of by his stripes, we are healed, visual analogies between Jesus' suffering, wanting to take on our own. And then from there, it's the half step, quarter step to... And then he also takes it on our our debt, mm-hmm. not just spiritually, but literally. And so right. we they, they really freight the cross with um, a lot. I mean, put putting mm-hmm. put simplistically, like Jesus then doing all the hard work that we might have, and then it goes straight Easter Sunday, in which in which we get to live in this victorious aftermath. You know, which of you know, it's always a struggle with the Paul and the. Yeah. Well, Romans but I, the- I think the reason I bring that up I- I earlier is because I do – that I think it is biblical in a sense. I think it is – I guess now that I'm, I'm older, I'm not particularly a part of that tradition anymore. I just feel like it's so easy to dismiss it as like, how could you do – how could you believe this? It, it kind of starts to become a caricature. 
instead, I just think like, like you said, I really appreciate what you have said in the past and are saying here. It's like, well, it's really just like a half step. Like if you just take a few half steps, then you, you can get here pretty easily, actually. And I just think that's an important thing to state because I think it's easy to dismiss maybe the more extravagant examples of this. Sure. But I think it's harder to weed out the places where we probably kind of have similar foundational assumptions in our kind of everyday life. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think it, it really, it's so it can work forwards from, you know, an understanding of righteousness and obedience and its rewards, but it also works directly backwards from the character of God to say, you know, isn't it, is not God good? Does God not want, you know, who would, when their child asks for bread, give them a stone? I mean, and, you know, in a world in which we have, you know, pediatric oncology and, um, Hotels that collapse, you know, and, and I mean, just the, the wild individual, structural, moral, natural evil of all kinds. It does feel more theologically intuitive sometimes to just say, like, man, can't we just start from the idea that God is good and therefore mm-hmm. right. good things right. should should possibly be within right. our reach? It's a way of making sense of things, right? And- which for you, kind of your story, I, I right. kind of want to maybe make that turn because it, for those who don't know, and I don't, I don't, you can say more about your story, but you had a diagnosis that sort of led to a different perspective of of God and these things of evil and how do we how do we handle yeah. some of this? So maybe you can share a little bit of that story and sure. tie it to how it shifted your perspectives on all this. Yeah, well, I mean, I was uh, I was thirty five when I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, and it was absolutely truly like un it was unbelievable to me because i had you know no cancer in my family i had no indication that i was going to be like un unbearably unlucky in my life and that and that there was really going to be no certainly no easy way out but maybe no way out at all mm-hmm. and um and i you know the i think people probably Maybe everybody would feel surprised or something, you know, just and and the shock and the sadness and the, you know, et cetera, of it being you and not someone else. Like you always know it's, you know, that other person that was struck by tragedy. But when it's actually you, there is just like the weirdest, most surreal feeling. Like is like it that that to me felt really close to outrage. Like not just outrage for my kid and my husband and and everybody else who gets a terrible deal for my death, but like, like yes, but haven't I been pretty good mm-hmm. this whole time? I mean, not just Bible camp good, but like become a divinity school professor and not commit any of the exciting sins kind of good. And like what an... What a strange kind of thing to have to imagine that, like, there is just, sorry, I'm, like, genuinely no reward <laughs> for being yeah. good. <laughs> is, do we get nothing out of this? I'm sorry. Yeah. Is this yeah. not in any way going to contribute to not just, like, my comfort or my, you know, wouldn't I love to enjoy the, you know, like a, like a, like a four-door sedan, you know? Mm-hmm. But, like, you I mean, I don't even get to, like, be a mom like mm-hmm. I get to give the gift of of just of perpetual sadness to my family who must live in the wake of what's happened to me. Like it just it really felt impossible to imagine that that was something that God could just sort of be blase about. And I felt a lot of it took me a bit to try to even imagine compassion toward all the Christian answers mm-hmm. I then got because. Wow. Because, wow, as a culture, we sure do love to explain God. And so, I got a lot of immediate, um, <laughs> not just kind of God wants an angel sorts of things, but like, um, heaven is heaven is the solution to the problem of pain, or uh, God, you know, what is, what, is the, what is the verb there for turns everything to the good? That verse? G- goodifies it. Well, yeah, in Romans 8, 28, God, <laughs> yes. yeah, all things um, yes. work out for the Comes good. together, for, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Like it was all just a sort of conspiracy to teach me. There's a lot of just people really wanting me to learn spiritual lessons. And, and, and 
I, it's I almost mean, like it, you it, needed to learn them or something, you know, like oh, yeah. there's something Obstacle. wrong with you even. I don't know. Maybe like it's yeah, an absolutely. opportunity for you to learn. And yeah. it's, a, it's an object lesson. And they're going to teach you even though they've, they've never experienced this. Or met me or, I mean, the, like you. the right. there is such a deep desire. I mean, just naturally, I think, to explain away the things that just scare the crap out of us. And of course, the unexplained suffering of others really gets at that place. And But I am... Um, but I could really see how it's very difficult personally to know what um, even like the word faith means. People always say, you know, have faith in God. And it always felt like it was like, what's the answer? What's the end of that sentence? Have faith yeah. in God to do what? Right. Because I don't have relationships with people in which I, I might say that I have faith in them without actually having a, a series of like specific things in mind, like that they're trustworthy is and they do what they say they're going to do, that they show up, that they, you know, et cetera. And so it was it was hard then to try to reimagine faith and trust and hope and what all those words mean if there is in fact no solution to pain. And yeah, that's why I sort of get really it, it's taken me a bit to kind of like shape the words mm -hmm. in my mind that there that the thing I say to myself is like there is no cure to being human. Like there is finitude is going to be part of this this deal, but man, do I understand prosperity gospel that says that they just want to be able to look back through the details of their life and and be able to 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 draw that straight line between and then things worked out because I have a God who loves me. So okay, did you then struggle with the theology that you were a part of? Or did you really struggle with God's injustice? Hmm. I, mean, I think there's a difference between those two things. Like, God's fine, but boy, these people fed me, you know, a bill of goods. Or is it more like, mm -hmm. I have no idea who God is. I, I, I have well, to start over. I have like a nice uh, bonus, uh, which is that... You're an atheist? I am now here <laughs> to tell you that I am no... no. I... Um, I really did experience the unbelievable comfort of the Holy Spirit. Like the more I, the more I was in the hospital, the more I suffered, the worse things got. Really, the the Holy Spirit was such a a very weird, shocking bonus. And then I, then I, so there was a sense always that even though I was um, horrified by what was happening, that I did not experience God's absence in any way. Mm -hmm. But I was very angry at what it's like to live under the weight of so many cultural solutions for how for how to live or how to die. And that has been the thing that I devote now so much of my intellectual and spiritual energy to, which is sort of pulling apart these kind of self-help and cultural myths we have. It, because I just think it is like it endlessly compounds the suffering of um, of people already going through too much. So you're you're really giving a theology of suffering, in a sense, right? To, like how to think about it, yeah, Christianly, right? Is that is that yeah. a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. So, so one yeah. thing, I mean, I came across something that you said someplace or wrote someplace. I don't remember, but um, there are no reasons or formulas, mm -hmm. which I think is a very profound and catchy thing. Could you just flush that out a little bit more? Well. I think what I was struggling with was, was, was the, the feeling of living in a hyper-causal universe, right, in which everybody's reasons, even the, even the lovely ones, even the ones I'm not entirely sure that there's a great argument for or against when, like, God has a plan, but – or, like, all things are good. <laughs> I just mm. – I think that our – you know, I – bless the Reformed. Bless them. <laughs> I just – I don't have – I – I no longer live in a world in which in which God's reasons are immediately discernible to me. I just don't. Mm -hmm. And also, I found it very difficult to escape all of the even cultural formulas for for how we live. I I'm just never far from a from a juicing cleanse that someone is recommending me, or um, the everything happens for a reason crowd is just. I feel like they're just trolling me wherever I go, or can't go into a Target without being forced into a just a good vibes only section of the women's department mm. uh, and and so much of that is these very same these very same sort of theological source beds that we were talking about for the prosperity gospel 
the the an American theology of triumphalist individualism, the simplicit theologies of of health and wealth, and and this metaphysical idea that somehow our positivity like draws back to ourselves every like a boomerang, every good thing. So I I've really been thinking about just how each formula, you know, whether it be everything happens for a reason or that I should try the four hour work week or that, you know, infinity is at the bottom of my inbox, that each one imagines a solution to the problem of pain. Mm -hmm. And that I'm really only going to be able to find my way through this by understanding like our deep finitude. But then, you know, dear God, that's, that's going to take more courage than I realized. That's a serious journey. <laughs> you know, it is. I mean, it's, it I is. Mean, it's, 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 it is. Right? It, I, yeah, I would say it does feel. It's painful. You know? That feels like the uphill climb in yeah. our culture yeah. isn't and, being okay with that place. And in some ways, it feels like, you know, Christianity has been, been co opted, complicit in. I don't know the right word for that. Yeah. But there, this sense of. I just I feel like as a culture we we have conspired to brush under the rug all forms of suffering and death. And there's this this spiritual bypassing that you know that's the kind of the term I think we had Allison Cook on talk about that. The spiritual bypassing where Christianity isn't about working through the suffering, being present in and within the suffering. It is another thing that we can put over top of our negative, quote, feelings so we don't have to address them, we don't have to talk about them. And it just leaves people feeling extremely alone. And, I, you know, I've been uh, listening to and reading about kind of the life of uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the, the, how it was in the 60s when even in a hospital you would have dying patients at the end of the halls. Like, you couldn't even find dying patients because even the doctors didn't want to address death. And I just think we have to deal, we have to, we're now reaping the rewards, in air quotes, of a culture that spent decades ignoring the reality of suffering and death. And it, it just, I think what I'm getting at is I find it frustrating, and I'm, what I'm hearing from you is the frustration that this thing that is supposed to be so life-giving has become coming to this cheap imitation of itself because we're not willing to dig into the reality of suffering and death, which when I read the New Testament, and when I read the whole Bible, because it's an ancient book, death is everywhere because we all just were, you didn't go five, ten years without seeing death because it just wasn't there. So, I mean, is that part of what you're saying? Is that behind these phrases and you, these uh, shticks and catchphrases is an inability to deal with pain and suffering and death? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what a cons what a consequence to live now in a death denying culture in a, in a plague. I mean, it is it is wild what we think that our um, our our mindset. Can you just can you free me from the mindset, people? Can I just go somewhere <laughs> where I do not? I will not be found by someone telling them, me that my mindset will determine my reality. You, you no, can't well, escape do, humanity. It, no, at no way you have to deal with that humanity too. Okay, right? Just it's, it, there's no <laughs> there's no safe place to go from our humanity. I think it's really interesting that the gospel. I mean, it's like the gospel's legs are cut out from underneath it. Yeah. When we don't deal with the stuff, you know, yes. and just the raw honesty and authenticity to say, this sucks, yes. and I can't explain it. And yeah. somehow, you know, one, one reason why the book of Ecclesiastes is probably my favorite book of the Old Testament, because he goes on and on saying, this really sucks. I don't know what God's doing, but it's not fair. I don't like it. And yeah, things look good for five minutes, and they tank again. And then he ends the book saying, basically, yeah, what I just said, you need to listen to that, but here's what you do, you keep walking. You know, that's not naivete. That's actually facing, I think, the the crap and saying the answer to that is to, as he puts it, fear God and keep the commands. And we might say, keep trying to trust Jesus along the way anyhow. That's that's very hard to, I mean, you know is better than most people. That's That, that can be hard to do. And um, 
And people don't always hear that. It's, they want that formula because they're conditioned to getting it. Because like Jared said, it's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, you have the form. That's, that's, you know, part of the problem too. It is, it is in Deuteronomistic theology. It, there are other voices in the Bible too, but you find it there. And so part of this, at least in my opinion, it really does affect, it's affected by what you think the Bible is there to do. And whether you're allowed to even interrogate the Bible and debate it based on other stuff it says. Like you mentioned, you know, Jesus didn't really have a prosperity life. Well, that's a good point. That's a counterpoint to Deuteronomistic theology. And But if you don't have, a um, you know, a faith structure that allows you to do that, you know, I think it just becomes harder maybe to sort of climb out of this and 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 the facade of like biblical support for for this kind of thinking. So that that's okay. I'm going to tack a question onto that because I think that's really helpful. What has in your journey here, as you've come uh, across other people, what is what helps people to to start to go down a road that's maybe more helpful uh, to to kind of um, start to rid themselves of a theology that's not able to hold up in light of the suffering that a lot of people face. Oh, and it's so hard. I mean, we have a multi-billion dollar wellness industry that that really does convince us that all of our problems are solvable. And so the problem, your life is a problem to be solved. Finitude is a problem to be solved. And it's it's hard to get to that generous place with yourself, with your body, with our, you know, with your not bikini body by summer kind of, um, we accumulate all of the, the parts of our story in our, in our bones. It is a weird, it is a weird kind of thing to, to make peace with that because there's, um, because it's grief, right? Every time mm-hmm. we lose something, it's a, it's a form of grief. I, uh, I, I guess part of what I, I've been so grateful when people um, seem to have like a real awareness of is is the gift of presence, is when they've learned to maybe put down some of that anxiety over not being able to solve other people's pain, if not their own, then they learn to just like leave a little breathing room for ambiguity, for not knowing, for not always having the right words or that fix. And then also remembering that in that space, it's not just that they're you know, the gift of community, which is so precious, and also the gift of presence, because I love presence. When I'm suffering, <laughs> please give me presence. It's so great. Um, but in that space also comes the comforter. Like, this truly, like, this, the, the part of it that's the worst, and it is the worst, because in pain, you are trapped in your own stupid body, in your own stupid life, and no one can take that away from you. And yet, also, God... God's very weird A game is suffering. When I, you know, I always thought maybe because I had gone to like one of those endlessly hippie drum circle schools where I thought like, oh, inversion. I just like, I just need to be near the insert upside down where it's like the, 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 the poor, the sick, the unfortunate, like because that is going to help me be a really good person. Well, I mean, Turns out it's just where God is, <laughs> like because God's beautiful surprise is always seen in this in in the weird inversion. So the worse my life got, the more obvious God's love became because I was genuinely unable to put my own life back together. So I think that the Holy Spirit is not a solution. It's just like a weird reminder that in the midst of it, God abs that's the only promise I feel really in that is like my mm-hmm. only true prosperity gospel is that like somehow when you have less, you will in the very weirdest way have more only because God is there. You'll have that presence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Kate, thank you so much for spending time with us here. We had a great time talking about a topic that you know, I think a lot of people struggle with and with yeah. your experience and your, you know, and also your academic filter, putting all those things together. You know, you've Thanks. obviously got a lot to say to people about a topic that I think you're right, as you said, is is central to just the nature of humanity, but also the nature of the Christian faith and maybe even yeah. central to what God is like. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, yeah. well, thanks so much for having me. Truly, Absolutely this was a good. joy. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of a bummer. So I think we're going to put like a some music behind it, like could you just dance play music, me out, play me out with EDM like a, or something, something really upbeat. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We got to leave people on a high. I'm sorry to say, so uh, and just undermine <laughs> the importance of this the whole episode. Of Daryl, you, Jared. You, Jared has to get past his prosperity thinking of avoiding <laughs> yeah, yeah. pain, and yes. everything has to work yes. out good. <laughs> is, is that you why I mean? asked you for money? Oh, is that why I paid? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. thanks so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, best wishes on on kind of keeping going down this track and, and meeting people with where they are on this. Thanks. Thanks, right, okay. See ya. You just made it through another entire episode of The Bible for Normal People. Well done to you. And well done to everyone who supports us by rating the podcast, leaving us a review, or telling others about our show. We are especially grateful for our producers group who support us over on Patreon. They are the reason we are able to keep bringing podcasts and other content to you. So a big thanks to Jaime Ernesto Rodriguez, Ron Spaziri, John Bush, Kyle Miller, Pastor John Andrews, Andy, Bruce Sims, Jane Smith, Brandon Stutheit, and Michael Jack. If you would like to help support the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people where for as little as $3 a month, you can receive bonus material, be a part of an online community, get course discounts, and much more. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Our show is produced by Stephanie Spate, audio engineer Dave Gerhardt, creative director Tessa Stoltz, community champion Ashley Ward, and web developer Nick Striegel. Copyright 2021, The Bible for Normal People. All rights reserved. In other words... No coffee or you're in big trouble. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening.